Hey boys and girls, I'm going to share the Apaca Theory with you again um, by Maylee Malloy. And we're going to try and do chapters 10 and 11 today because I discovered that chapter 10 is only like two pages long. That seems short. Um, so some things I want you to think about because this is getting kind of exciting is what would you ask if you use the smell of truths or truth? I think they just call it truth. But, you know, an S is fun. What will Benjamin and Janie do with the information they, oh my goodness, it's a good thing I proofread my work. Grab that pen. They, oh dear, so difficult. Wrong color too. They discover, and then how will this change things? I had to throw in that like notice and note question because, um, the way that I formulate some of my questions is because I use notice and notes so often when I read, when I think about um, what I'm reading, and I ask myself questions, and it leads me to other questions. And so when you look at these, right, if you are always stopping and jotting about contrast and contradictions or aha moments, tough questions, words of the wiser again and again in memory moments, and you're asking yourself the anchor questions, then you start to ask yourself questions like this. Hey, what if I use those? Put yourself in the um, character's shoes, and then you say, wait a minute, I just they just got all this information. How are they gonna use it? So these things help us um, read more deeply and understand more. And it all starts with getting good at something basic like using notice and note strategies to stop and think about the text. Um, and so readers, I suggest that if you're familiar with notice and note strategies, you use them to ask yourself questions as you read, okay? So here we go. Chapter 10, The Smell of Truth. We left the physics garden and walked back down the Chelsea embankment with the veritas herb and something like a plan. Or at least I thought we had a plan, but Benjamin was having none of it. It's all rubbish, he said, invisibility spells, herbs that make you tell the truth. If you cut them at noon, if the gardener told you he was king of the fairies, would you believe him? No, I said, but it's possible that the herb affects the brain somehow, like alcohol does, or coffee. So you want to just waltz into Shishkin's house and get him to smell a pot of leaves? Do you know how a Soviet agent is trained? Do you? I asked. I know we're no match for it. I wasn't sure what had made me so brave, possibly being in another country that was so different from my own, possibly trying to match what I thought was Benjamin's courage. But I felt determined to move forward in the only way we could. You said you wanted to live a life of adventure, I said. Let's just test the herb and see if it works. Benjamin rolled his eyes but had no argument. So we went to my flat, which was eerily quiet with my parents at work. I filled a pot with water, according to the gardener's instruction, and boiled the crushed herb on a tiny kitchen in the tiny kitchen closet stove. Benjamin sat stubbornly at the card table with his arms crossed. The leaves turned dark green in the hot water, and the steam from the pot was sharp and minty. I stood over the pot, breathing it in for a few long seconds, then turned to him. Now you do it, I said, feeling strange and a little guilt, giddy. Benjamin eyed me. Do you feel all right? A little strange, I admitted, but go ahead. You're the one who thinks nothing will happen. And how do you suppose to test it, Madame Curie? We have to think of a question that we wouldn't otherwise want to answer. He stood over the pot looking down at the leaves, something like, who do you fancy? That might work, I said, even though it was the last question I wanted to answer. But it was impossible, suddenly, to tell a lie. Benjamin took a deep sniff over the steam and turned to me. All right, he said. So, who do you fancy? I hesitated. Fancy means like. Right? I asked, stalling. Of course. I gritted my teeth against the answer coming out, but I couldn't stop myself. You, I said helplessly. Me? Benjamin flushed crimson. I was sure I was doing the same. His freckles darkened when he blushed. Oh, 
That's embarrassing, I said. I hate this. Quick, before it wears off, who do you fancy? I don't want to answer. You'll have to. I could see him struggling with the effort. Ah! He said, I hate this too. All right, I like Sarah Pennington. I was too shocked, briefly, to be mortified that it wasn't me. Sarah Pennington, I said. She's awful. She's mean and pretentious. I know, he said. He seemed generally, genuinely sorry about it, but she's also beautiful. I don't want to like her, but I can't help it. She sits in front of me in mats, and the curve of her neck under that braid drives me completely mad. Stop, I said, enough. It works. We glared at each other in silence. Anyway, she has a crush on Mr. Danby, I said before I could stop myself. Benjamin was aghast. Mr. Danby? She thinks he's dreamy, and she's right. He's also smart and nice. Benjamin looked pained, and there was another long, sullen silence. I didn't know if I was happy to have hurt him or not, so I crossed my arms and looked out the window at St. George's street below, street below. The sad haberdasher across the street was standing in his doorway as usual, waiting for customers who came, never came. How do we tell when this thing wears off? Benjamin asked. I don't like you, I said experimentally, but that's not a good test. At the moment, it's kind of true. Say you don't fancy Sarah Pennington. I don't fancy Sarah Pennington. There we go, I said with a pang in my heart. You can lie. It's worn off. Let's pretend that never happened, he said. Do you still think it's rubbish? He shook his head. No, he said. It works. So boys and girls, we just made some cool discoveries and now we're gonna move on to chapter 11, the samovar. You have to figure out what a samovar is. See if you can do it. Benjamin, from his amateur spying, knew exactly where the Shishkins live, in a flat near the Soviet embassy. The afternoon had grown cold and we walked in silence, nursing our regrets about the smell of truth. Scarves wrapped around our faces and hands shoved in our pockets. The Shishkin's front door was in a row of narrow brick houses, all attached to each other. There were steps leading up to it. Up to it. Benjamin said, so now what? Well, I said, we'll say we're here to see Sergi. Maybe I have a Latin question. You don't know enough Latin to have a question. So it's a social visit. We want to show him this wonderful tea we discovered. As if that doesn't sound suspicious. You have a better idea, Mr. Super Spy? No. All right, I said. I strode up the steps and rang the bell, thinking he would rather be with Sarah Pennington anyway. So why was I doing this? Janie, wait, he said. Are you coming or not? Benjamin looked up and down the empty street as if someone with a better plan might be coming along, then ran up the steps after me. This is daft, he said. Sergi opened the door. He had changed out of his school uniform and wore a sweater and gray wool pants with house slippers. His broad shoulders seemed slightly less rounded and protective of his soft middle than they did at school. He was surprised to see us and tossed his hair out of his eyes. Loneliness came off him like steam rising, so I tried to summon some confidence that whatever crazy thing I proposed, he would want to join in. Hi, Sergi, I said. We wondered if you were busy. For what? He asked. We're thinking of entering the science competition at school, I said, but we need a third person on our team. Science competition, said Sergi. There is a science competition? We want to do, a, do botany as our subject, I said, willing myself not to blush. Right now, we're exploring the properties of this one particular herb. A remarkable herb, Benjamin put in, pronouncing the H as if to clarify. Maybe we, may we please come in? Sergi stood back from the door and we walked into a small anteroom hung with coats with a staircase that led up to a second floor. I wondered if his father was up there, the Soviet agent. 
We have to brew it like tea, I said. Can we use your kitchen? You want to use the samovar? We must have looked at him blankly. It's a Russian teapot. Perfect, Benjamin said. I heard uneven footsteps upstairs as Sergi led us into the kitchen. I remembered Mr. Shishkin's wooden leg, so he was home and we could try the herb on him. The kitchen clearly belonged to two men living alone. It was full of unwashed dishes and, the, and smelled of onions. I'm not sure what that has to do with being two men alone. My mother is in Russia with my sister, Sergi said in apology. Here is the samovar. It was a large silver urn, elaborately decorated in relief with leaves and vines, with a teapot on top. It looked out of place in the shabby kitchen. It was my grandmother's, he said. We just had tea, so it's hot. Terrific, Benjamin said. I heard a thump upstairs and then another, and then careful sounds of Mr. Shishkin's wooden leg coming all the way down the stairs. I tried to act natural, bustling around in the kitchen, but my heart felt like it would leap out of my chest. Then Mr. Shishkin was standing in the kitchen doorway. What are you doing with the samovar, he asked. His accent was more Russian than Sergi's, less British, and he was even bigger up close. His body filled the door frame and his hands looked the size of baseball mitts. Making tea, sir, Benjamin said. Sorry to intrude. You are Sergi's friends? Yes, I said. He gazed past us to the dirty dishes in the sink. My wife is in Russia, he explained. I am not a good housekeeper. We don't mind, sir, Benjamin said. If you and Sergi want to sit in the parlor, we're about to do an experiment. Mr. Shishkin's eyes narrowed in suspicion. What experiment? We'll show you, Benjamin said with the air of a magician about to do a trick. It's science. Please have a seat in there. The two Shishkins removed themselves reluctantly to the little front parlor, and Benjamin and I stuffed the crushed leaves into the samovar teapot and filled it with boiling water from the urn. We could hear the Shishkins talking together, and I heard the word science competition mixed in with the Russian. You'll think it'll, you think it will work in the samovar, I asked. I don't know, Benjamin said. We'll have to pour it into something else. I handed him the only clean teacup from a row of hooks, and we filled it with the pale greenish brew. Just don't smell it yourself, I said, or we'll start confessing everything. Benjamin took the cup in one hand, held a tea towel over his face with the other, and headed into the parlor. Yeah, that wouldn't be suspicious. The visual is hysterical. I followed. The very fascinating thing about this herb, Benjamin told the Shishkins through the towel, is the way the smell changes over time. It starts out very sharp and exhilarating. Here, please try. He held the cup out. Mr. Shishkin leaned away. Why do you cover your face? I'm getting a cold, sir. Please smell the tea before it changes. You smell it first. It might be dangerous. Oh, I've already smelled it, Benjamin said. And you are sick? An unrelated winter cold. I don't want to infect you. Mr. Shishkin crossed his thick arms over his chest. We are Russian. We don't get colds. Sergi said something imploring to his father, and the old man finally sighed, uncrossed his arms, and leaned over the diminishing steam from the cup. He seemed startled by the smell and looked up sharply at Benjamin. Where did you get this plant? He asked. I in the park. Mr. Shishkin lunged from his chair towards Benjamin, surprisingly agile in spite of his size and wooden leg. Krushchoya, he said, you smell it and then tell me where you found it. I backed into the kitchen and Benjamin backed up after me, holding the Keith cup in front of him like a weapon. Mr. Shishkin seemed even bigger and more powerful now that he was angry. Sergi was mortified. Leave them alone, Poppy, he said. They're going to let me on their science team. Hmm, we should probably catch up. They are not your science team, Mr. Shishkin said. Sergi ducked in front of his father, arms spread wide, and stood protecting us. 
Three years we have lived here, he said, and this is the first time my friends ever came to visit, and now you chase them out. They are not your friends, his father said, pushing him aside. They invent this to get to me. I stumbled backward in a panic, and my sleeve caught the silver faucet on the samovar. I tried to steady the urn, but it crashed to the floor. The hot pot spilled out of the teapot. Oops, sorry. The hot water spilled out of the teapot, and the whole kitchen was filled with the bracing minty smell of the leaves. There was no avoiding breathing it in. Where did you get this plant? Mr. Shishkin asked again. The giddy feeling came over me, the compulsion to blurt out the answer. I bit my tongue until it hurt, but I couldn't stop myself. At the Ch Chelsea Physics Garden, I said, from the gardener. He turned to Benjamin, who still had the towel over his face. This is true? No, Benjamin said, his voice muffled. I don't know what she's talking about. She doesn't know what she's talking about. It's true, I said. On Sunday, you passed a message to Benjamin's father. Then those men came for him. Who are they? Mr. Shishkin stared at me. His face turned an ashen gray as the blood drained from it. Then he switched on a radio on the kitchen counter and turned up the volume. Stupid children, he hissed under the sound of the cheery dance music. You think no one is listening? I knew about houses being bugged, but it hadn't occurred to me this one might be. Shishkin was right. We were stupid children. How had I thought we were equipped to conduct this interrogation? Under cover of the music, Shishkin whispered, This is where I had seen you, in the park. Is Marcus Burroughs your father? Take down the, this ridiculous towel. Benjamin lowered the towel. He is. Who else knows you have connected him to me? Only the gardener. Did you see your father taken? We were hiding in the cellar. We heard German voices. Did you see the man with a scar? We're supposed to ask the questions here, Benjamin asked. You have no idea the danger you are in, Shishkin whispered hoarsely. The man with the scar was there, I said. Who is he? He is a member of the Satsky, Mr. Shishkin said, the East German secret police, but he is working under the command of the Soviet security, the MGB. They must have discovered the apothecary. He slumped into a chair and put his head in his hands. His eyes fell on the dented samovar on the floor. You know what other thing samovar means in Russian, he asked. It is a word for the soldiers who lost their arms and legs in the war from shells and exploding mines because they look like, tea, like teapot with no arms and legs. You see, the Soviets sent them to Siberia so people would not see them and know how terrible is the war. My brother was one of these until he died there. They took his body and then they punished him for it. Losing my own leg, I could accept, but I could not forgive what they did to my brother, a war hero. When he died, I decided to help your father. There was a silence while we absorbed the horror of this confession. The dance music jangled along. Help my father with what? Benjamin finally asked. Why did the Soviets want him? Mr. Sishkin fought the urge to answer. I could see the muscles in his neck distend. There was a loud trumpet solo on the radio. There are two other scientists working with your father, he said. They have come to London to take part of his plan. To take part in his plan. Is Jin Lo one of them? Mr. Shishkin was purple with the effort not to speak. Please stop asking questions. I don't wish to compromise your father. If he and Jin Lo have been captured, I am in grave danger from both the British and the Soviets. So is your gardener, and so are you. I beg you to stay away from my son. But Papa, they can't, Sergi said. We're on the science team together. There is no science team, Mr. Shishkin barked. They lie to you. Sergi cowered for a moment, then said meekly, then they could join chess club instead. Mr. Shishkin, I need to find my father, Benjamin said. Tell us how to do that or we don't leave Sergi's side. It'll be science team practice all day long and we'll join the chess club. Shishkin hesitated, but the combination of truth serum and blackmail must have been too much for him. 
I don't know where he is, he said. We are to meet in two days at the port of London. If your father is not there, we will be finished. Finished how? And what's the plan? Shishkin shook his head, reached into his pocket, and produced a tiny capsule. Cyanide, Benjamin said, diving to stop him. No! Shishkin knocked Benjamin to the floor with one powerful arm. Then he put the capsule between his teeth and crushed it. It's not cyanide, he said. You have read too many stories. It will only make me mute for a time. I thought I would use it against the MGB and torture, not a boy and a pot of tea. Just tell me why Soviet security would be interested. I only want peace, Shishkin said. Just leave my boy up. And then his voice vanished. There wasn't even a whisper left. He couldn't make a sound. Wait, I need to know, Benjamin said. The jitterbug ended and silence fell briefly over the radio. I heard a whimper from the corner. Sergi was sitting on the wet kitchen floor with his grandmother's dented samovar in his lap and a devastated look on his face. His father was in danger. He was not a member of a science team and still no one had come to his house in three long years as a friend. Another song started up. Mr. Shishkin all but picked up Benjamin and me by the scruff of our necks, propelled us into the hall, past the stairs and the hanging coats. He could be eloquent in silence. There was nothing mute about the way he deposited us outside like two bags of trash and slammed the door. Well, that was an informative two chapters. Please think about what would you ask if you used the smell of truth? Do you think Benjamin and Jeannie use their time well? Or can you think of something more valuable to ask? Or if you had that, what would you ask of somebody if you could ask them anything and know they had to answer truthfully? What would you be curious about? And then what will Benjamin and Janie do with the information they discover? So you just noticed they got a lot of information in those two chapters, right? How's that going to change things? So I just gave you a ton of stuff to think about, and I'm really excited to see the outcome. Catch you later. Bye.